So Edgar Carrot, thank you so much for joining me on the Burning Castle podcast. Edgar is probably known to everybody listening, if he's not by chance. He's absolutely one of the greatest writers today in all languages and from any country. Um, he's known, I would say, primarily for his short stories, but you work across media. You work um, theater, in video and film and so much more. And I think that's gonna be part of what I wanna talk about today with you. Um, but I think when, what I wanna start out with just is where you are, because that's that's so much of such a big question today in the coronavirus world, where we are, why we're there. Um, so just just give us a little intro in that regard. Yeah, well, I, I, I just wanna say, you know, that I was born and I grew up in the Tel Aviv area. Mm. And as a professor, I always have this joke that I share with my students that I say to them, I'm just like Immanuel Kant, only without the brains. Because, because the, for the past 54 years, I've been living in a, only in four apartments. Wow. That the distance between the two furthest one would be four kilometers. So basically, since the day I was born, I've been taking my coffee in the same coffee place, you know. Imagine me as a six months year or six months old baby drinking my coffee. I still drink in the same place that I used to drink when I had diaper. <laughs> and and the and all this is just to say that that the, you're speaking to me now while I'm in Berlin mm -hmm. because for the first time in my life I took a, a sabbatical year away from a, a Israel and I'm living in a different place. And I, it's a strange experience and it would have never happened. It's not for the COVID, mm. but there was something about the pandemic that, uh, that uh, my uh, teenage son uh, told me and my wife that he felt that he was stagnating, that basically he was watching YouTube and playing games all the time and Zooming, boring Zooms. And, and he said, you know, I feel that life is too easy for me. I feel mm. like I'm a... Uh, I'm gift wrapped, you know. I'm protected. I'm, I want. I, I want to. I want things to be difficult. Mm -hmm. And then we sat down and thought, okay, how can we make things difficult? You know, we can tie you to bed. We can <laughs> punch you every time you go to sleep. And he wasn't that much into that. So, so we we thought that maybe an interesting or a challenging thing would be to to go to another place in the world. And uh, for him to study in English because it's not our native tongue, and uh, and basically the only place that we could afford doing it was to have a, both a good school and that we could afford an apartment was in Berlin. Mm -hmm. So we found ourselves in Berlin, and and basically it began as our son's adventure, but it became of course me and my wife's adventure too because because the strange thing is that. Uh, uh, when you live in the same neighborhood, uh, surrounded with the same people uh, for so many years, you, I realize that you don't look at details at all. You know, when I go to mm -hmm. my cafe, if you'd ask me uh, how do the table looks that look like, is there a tree outside, I would never know because I've been there for so many years that I don't have any kind of authentic experience when I enter the cafe. And suddenly here, when I'm in Berlin, you know, every tree looks strange, every square mm -hmm. looks suspicious, you know. I look at a store, I try to figure out what they sell there. I look at a poster, I try to, to understand if I'm looking at a sex symbol or a sex offender, you know, because I can't understand the text. <laughs> so so uh, I must say that it's kind of like, a, it's an interesting period because for me, for the first time, I would say in the last 30 years, the, the, the central thing in my life is my life and not some project. You know, in any other given time, you'd say, what, what, what's in your mind? I would say, I'm making a movie, I'm writing a book. But right now I would say, I'm trying to figure out how you buy a ticket for the subway. You know, that's, a, mm -hmm. that's basically the, the excitement a part of my life at this moment. I was just reading a book by Pima Chodron, who is the great um, Buddhist monk, talking about how a turning point in her life was a sabbatical as well. 12 months and she did nothing for those 12 months no teaching you know writing just here and there occasionally but it was not about the writing it's exactly what you're saying so 
um, what got you to the point of taking the sabbatical? Because you could have gone to Berlin for your son's sake and just continued to on to the next project. Why did you stop? Well, this too, I think, had to do with the pandemic because I think that there was something about the pandemic and the lockdowns that they kind of broke the force of inertia in our life. You know, because I think, that, you know, both, both of us, I would say, 90% of the stuff that we do is not the stuff that we choose to do, you know. I don't mm. know. When you get back up in the morning, you drop your, your children at school, you go and buy stuff in the supermarket, you visit your sick aunt. It's not as if, like, you sit on your chair and say, oh, what would I like to do? Oh, yes, I would like to drop my son at school. Yeah, that would be amazing. You know, we don't mm -hmm. take those decisions. And with the lockdown and with the force of inertia, it was as if somebody kind of lifted the handbrake in the middle of a drive. And there was something about this feeling of stopping and this feeling of kind of being reflexive and asking yourself questions about a lot of the stuff that, that you do, that it was both challenging but interesting. And I thought that, you know, if I go to Berlin and I teach in Berlin and I do the same stuff I do in Israel, I miss the opportunity of really kind of a, a being a, a, a in closer touch with my emotions and my feelings and my wishes. So I said, you know, okay, Hey, if we go on an adventure, let it be an adventure all the way. Berlin seems to be a good choice for artists. I know um, a good friend of mine whose name is Romeo Alaef. He's a photographer who lives in Berlin and moved there. He lived in Brooklyn and was working as a photographer in Brooklyn and was priced out of Brooklyn and ended up in Berlin. Do you feel like there's something beyond the prices that keeps people in Berlin as, as working artists? Well, well, I must say that, is that, you know, as an artist, I always uh, felt lucky uh, writing and creating in Tel Aviv because, because let's say when I go to places like Paris or New York, they feel like museums. Mm. You know, like Paris is a museum of the 19th century. Yeah. In New York, it's a museum of the 20th century. But basically, you live in a place that really uh, has some kind of a, a, a Wikipedia photo of how things should be like. You know, right. let's say if I go to New York and I see two cops uh, uh, coming, uh, I don't know, to a breakfast place and asking for a salad, I would say, no, it's wrong. You should have a donut. You should be, <laughs> you should be better. You know, I know how a New York cop should look like. Right. What I liked about uh, Tel Aviv is that I always felt that it was a, a, a city that, that basically was debating its, ident its identity. Like, what is... What is Tel Aviv? Is it a, a, a synagogue, a Chabad house, a, a gay street party? You yeah. know, a, 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 what, what is it? Like, you know, is it Jaffa? Is it uh, north of Tel Aviv? So, so uh, there is something about these things that, that things are not yet decided that it gives you a lot of freedom as an artist. And I feel the same about Berlin. I feel that mm -hmm. Berlin is really with the unification, with the East and the West, the, with uh, parts that you know that have uh, sometimes a fascist and anti-Semitic uh, past, and also a very st strong liberal and uh, a green powers, you know, then then it, it's a really good a good uh, place to ask yourself, where am I? Who am I? What is this place? What is worth living for? What could be the void? So there, I think that there's something about this vividness that gives you some kind of an elbow room uh, to ask questions and create. I, I can tell you in comparison that I lived in Jerusalem for a period of time. And it was very, very difficult for me to write while I was in Jerusalem because I felt that there was such strong narrative already existing there. You know, it's really like Jerusalem, Jerusalem kind of doesn't give you the freedom uh, to move the stones around and to say, oh, no, actually, Jerusalem is another thing. You know, Jerusalem is Jerusalem. The wedding wall is the wedding wall. The dispute about the city exists all the time. And I think that, uh, that uh, Berlin is really, is really this kind of place that is totally open for interpretation with, you know, with, with its history being bombed away uh, with some kind of a conflicted attitude toward nationality, toward the past, and all those things they, they really uh, offer some kind of a variety of narrative that uh, I don't see in other uh, major cities of, uh, of 
in countries the history wasn't challenged, you know? I mean, if you talk to a Frenchman or if you talk to an Englishman, basically, you know, they could be critical or not critical, but in the bottom line, they say, oh, you know, we got something right. We've been living for the last 300 years. We shouldn't have started this war. We shouldn't have invaded this place, but all in all, we get something going. But when you talk to German people, you know, it's really, I think the Germans and Israelis are the only two people I know that can sometimes be against their own uh, national soccer teams. You know, it's like when Germans talk about German football, they talk about it they, like, you know, what is this thing? You know, they have no soul, you know? <laughs> so so, so I, I, there is something that I like about this, this uh, point of view, which is very uh, subversive and it allows, uh, allows you to see things in a different way. It, kind of, it has this kind of flexibility that you really don't have when you are part of a winning culture. My first book of fiction is called Tel Aviv Stories, and it's about um, the what I thought of as the underclass in Tel Aviv, which is the beggars and the homeless and the people you, you tend not to see, but in Tel Aviv, you did see them because they could still be individuals in that city. And this was, you know, 15 years ago. But today, I feel like when I look at Tel Aviv, I see a museum of the 21st century, which is never something I would think that I would see in Tel Aviv the way that I knew it back then. Um, but you know, it speaks to the changing nature of, of Israeli identity and of Israeli literature, which you're which you're so central to. And you know, we used to have these big, you know, ideas writers of Israeli fiction, David Grossman, Amos Oz, and it was conflict and it was identity. And you came and you gave something completely different, which was the Israeli individual, the Israeli typus, the the, the character of Israeli life. Um, I think that's, the question I have is, do you feel like the culture is moved, moving beyond all the big concepts, conflict and history and Holocaust and moving it towards something in Israel that is more individualistic and is more quirky and zany and more reflective of the kind of writing that you're doing and, and you were just with, you were surfing that current or do you feel like you're more an outlier to the, the Israeli cu culture as it is today? Well, well, you know, I, I, I think the Israeli, Israeli cultures, there is so many things, you know, so, so, so I think that, is, I think that, you know, there are many streams and, and I'm a part of one of them. But for me, a, being a child of Holocaust survivor, I always a, watched my parents a, basically a, impersonating a, a sabras, trying to pass as people who, who do, not, do not have a, a, a Robinson passed in another uh, continent. Mm -hmm. You know, my, I remember that uh, one time somebody told my mom that she has a Polish accent. And I remember after training in saying the, that, that word again without an accent, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it's something that you really didn't want to bring up. Yeah. And I, I think that when I was a child, I, I kind of had the living in a socialist society, there was some kind of a, a facade of what it means to be Israeli. But something different back home. So you know, you would go outside and talk about politics in Hebrew and be, have a very good time. But then you come back and you talk to your wife in Yiddish, you know, <laughs> and eat your Eastern European food. You know, and there was something about me that when I came to write, I wanted to write a, not about the social narrative, a very much like Grossman or Old. I didn't want to tell the story of the society. I wanted to tell the stories that. People were hiding after they were closing their doors. Right. And, and I wanted, in a sense, maybe to tell my parents' story, you know, that they, that, that they were really, a, they were kind of trying to merge together two kinds of identities, the Israeli identity that they aspired to and the traumatic Eastern European uh, identity uh, that they traveled with. And, they, and I think that, 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 there, that there was something in the way, in the way that I wanted to, uh, uh, to write about Israel was, I almost had the wish to, to break this kind of very uh, uh, solid narrative to pieces. I wanted to deconstruct it in a way. And believing that if I deconstruct it enough, there will be kind of a freedom uh, for me to be myself in it. Because I think that kind of growing up as a child, you know, with parents from the Holocaust, you know, uh, uh, with the very strong Israeli ethos, my father was in the Irgun, 
my mother was among the people who mm. is, is started the Kriya, which was a very uh, right-wing political party. So kind of growing up knowing that I'm supposed to be a great soldier and I'm supposed to bring Israeli society a step further. But at the same time, having doubts and thoughts and fears and confusion. So I said, okay, in life, I have to pretend to be okay, but writing is kind of a confessional uh, a place, almost kind of like a safe, safe city as they had in the Bible, a place where I can be me. And I think that when I looked for inspiration for writing, I didn't look at the great Israeli writer whom I really love and admire, but I looked for inspiration among, among Jewish diaspora writers, like Kafka, Isaac Babel, Bashevi Singer, yeah. Shalom Aleichem, that, that there was something in their point of view that wasn't trying to tell the story of their country, not even the story of the shtetl, but the story of an individual who tries to belong to something that he can't always figure out. You know, I feel many times that uh, in, when I was a child in Israel, that I was trying to, to pick up on something that I didn't even know what that thing was. And, mm -hmm. and, and it, so I have a story called uh, The Son of the Head of the Mossad. Mm -hmm. and, in the, and it's the story about the son of the head of the Mossad. And of course, the head of the Mossad, especially in the past days, would have a, a fake alias, like he would yeah. work in something else. So, so the story about the, the, the son of the head of the Mossad, that he really wants to be like his father, but he feels that his father is a construction manager. <laughs> so he wants to be like his father, but he's, who the hell is his father? You know, when I grew up as a child, I even wrote a fiction story about it. Uh, the biggest Israeli a ch children book a nationalistic hero was a guy called Danny Dean. And Danny Dean was in, an invisible child who helped Israel win its war against uh, Syria and against mad Nazi scientists. And I thought to myself, there's something so fitting that this kind of new Zionist role model would be an invisible child. So the children who read those books say, we want to be just like this guy, but we don't know how this guy looks like, you mm -hmm. know? So there was something about this kind of a obscure ambition that, uh, that was always uh, interesting. And I felt that, that you know, that if I, uh, I find the right way to, to write, it would give me this kind of wiggle room to be myself. You know, the, the, some of these stories, when they're set against Israeli society, bring out the, this, this contradiction or some sort of clash between the individual and the, the bigger society, exactly as you're speaking about. But some of your stories are really just about the clash between the individual and baseline of, of life, of just, you, you highlight the absurd that's found in the mundane, that we see um, that things aren't the way they should be, and that's just the way they are. And the stories really show that to you to, as a reader, but in a world in which the mundane has become so in, insane and so crazy you know, on a moment by moment basis, um, do you feel like that the concept of the absurd is less a, an existential question today and almost it's becoming an issue, not of the absurd, but of the outrageous. We're constantly outraged, which makes it more of a moral or a political question than a, than a question of a exis, existence. I, I, I totally agree with you because, because you know, I think that the, the difference between absurd and outrageous is basically a, a, a difference of attitude. Mm. Like, I mean, when you look at something and you think it's absurd, it can amuse you, uh, you can be curious about it, you know, uh, but basically you want to interact with it. Right. When you see something is outrageous, you, you, f you see it as some kind of a mistake, you know, mm. something that should be fixed or destroyed. Right. And, I, and I really feel that, uh, that uh, what is very, very typical of uh, this, this time is uh, the lack of uh, tolerance or curiosity or interest in other narratives. Because, you know, when I look at a lot of the conflicts to, uh, today, I would say that even a decade ago, I would really think about the argument that, that, uh, that people are raising. But now, today, most I, I, uh, arguments, I kind of uh, go uh, one level up and I just look at, about the way the way that people are arguing, the way that people listen or don't listen to the other. It's almost kind of like a meta perception. 
You know, I think that the pandemic is an excellent example for that. Because if you think about it, there, you know, you have, you have many people who think that everybody should get vaccinated and that people that don't get vaccinated should have great sanctions. And there are other people who think that the, the, uh, that the institu institutions are forcing people too much uh, to, to, to take vaccinations and are not giving them the freedom to take their own decisions. Now, those, both those narratives are interesting, and I'm saying, especially because this is not a political or ideological question, it's, it's merely a scientific question in, in its source. Is it helpful? Isn't it helpful? Does it put people in danger? Doesn't it put people in danger? And you can see how the attitude of so many people to this objective question is, regardless of what they think, is just ex extreme, you know? <laughs> It's just intolerant. It doesn't matter right. if they scream about farm fascism or if they say that people who don't uh, get vaccinations should be locked in their home. It's just all about this kind of ideas that it's a uh, my way or the highway, mm -hmm. which is something that is very, very typical of, of this kind of social media era. Is that it doesn't matter what you think, you can you can build yourself easily a bubble where you'll be surrounded by people who think like you. And that all the people who don't think, think like you will be people that you don't personally know. So you don't have this bias that you respect them. You can just hate them, you know? And uh, it's, really, it's, it's really funny because I, I feel that the, the social media dynamic reminds me a lot of uh, uh, the dynamics that you have on highways. That, you know, when I drive a car and somebody cuts me, you know, and I stop him at the headlight and ask him to take, roll down his window, and I say to him, hey, you motherfucker, who taught you how to drive you ugly piece of shit, you know? Then, then basically, you know, sometimes during this conversation, this, I would say, oh, Mark, it's you. Oh, my God, I haven't seen you in years. Man, you lost weight. So you're still with your beautiful girlfriend. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, so this switch is really the switch between being in a situation where you're totally alienated from the world against you around you and everything that is not for you is, is against you and everything that is, is not in your interest is an abom abomination, you know, it's like the devil. And then suddenly you say, oh, I know this guy, he's actually nice, he can't drive, but he's such a great guy, you know? So, so, so I think that, that, that this kind of intimacy of really knowing people to kind of a, put some counterweight to this road rage that we feel, you know, doesn't exist in the social media. The really, it's really like, it's the op opinion we agree with, the opinion we don't agree with, and the people who carry the opinions we don't agree with just have those silly photos in Facebook where they hold their babies as if they were lumps of wood or, mm -hmm. or you know, or piece of bread, you know, and they look <laughs> dumb and they say dumb things and you have nothing to say for them, you know. They never gave you a bite of their sandwich. They never told you a joke. They just, you know, expendable you know and i think and i think that this is this is the thing that a literature would always try to fight because the idea of literature is really not a, a, a basically let's say in everyday life we see some we see things from one point of view and our survival mechanism is really built on alienating ourselves from people saying this guy is good for me i'm going to cross the street to the other side Here's a lion, I'm gonna hide in the wood. You know, it makes kind of a, a survival in this kind of sense. But the moment that you go to telling stories, then you can switch a point of view. And the moment that you switch a point of view, you can't see the other as the other. You know, it becomes a human being. You know, think about the Lolita or crime and punishment. You know, th these are books that put you in the mind of a pedophile or a murderer. And when you're inside this, this mind, you cannot uh, deny those characters' humanity, mm -hmm. and you cannot deny, a, let's say, the potential of, a, of a going wrong, a doing wrong in your own psyche. Because if I read a Lolita, you know, I'm not a pedophile, but if I read this and I say, oh yeah, I once loved the girl the same way that this guy loves the girl, and I was totally crazy and I did silly things. Okay, she wasn't 15, she was 18. But basically, I know what this guy is talking about. So, so this uh, ability to make this kind of differentiation and say there are murders and pedophiles who are bad and there is me who is good, it's basically being challenged, you know, by this, by this idea of saying, 
I'm human, they're human. I'm, I sometimes think about bad things and most of the time I don't do them. They sometimes think about bad things and sometimes they actually do them. And we're not that different. And I think, and I think that, that uh, actually the world really is in desperate need of fiction now because fiction, unlike nonfiction, it's not really, it's not really as if you have this kind of wave breaker, you know, that the, of a fact that is going to stop whatever flow you have. Because the moment it's nonfiction, you know, we can talk about the Israel-Palestinian conflict, and I could say we're occupying this land, and you say no, we don't occupy. And I say in '68 we did that, and you say oh, but in '73 we did that, and then I say no, we never did that, and we are all in the data. But the moment I say to you it's fiction, then we allow ourselves basically. Uh, to connect to humanity and philosophy in a more obscure uh, 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 and actually higher ideas and not just kind of keep doing this really little uh, petty bureaucratic uh, information about w- which fact should be put where in our list. That is something I absolutely want to come back to, which is the, the role fiction can play in such a crazy world. Um, but before that, I want to return to something you just said about um, the road rage case where, and about trying to find people who are thinking like you on social media, it's sort of what we do. We just we just create these tribes on social media of people that are thinking like you. But something that you recently pointed out over the summer in an essay for a tablet magazine is that the you of social media is not the same as the you that you know generally. There's two yous, and th- this is an amazing point that you made in this great essay. And the one you is that beautiful photo uh, that looks so great. I actually want to read a little bit out of, out of your essay um, because it, it really makes the point. And it's saying there's the same Edgar, as you write, um, but without the buck teeth and a- anxious eyes and with a little more sex appeal and a stronger, more manly chin, I know the picture doesn't look like me at all. And that's exactly why I love it, because it has sabotaged its original function as a representative of reality and taken on a different function. That picture is no longer a glance into a mirror that shows me who I am, but a look into a different dimension that shows me at who I could be someone a little bit braver, and more charismatic when the light hits him at the right angle. And you kind of sum it up with this one point, which says, the more polarized, unpredictable, and unstable the world becomes, the more crucial it seems to leave our shaky, battered bodies and relocate to a friendlier, more comfortable place. And I read that and I was like, oh my God, that's exactly what's happening. Our identities are being emptied into the this social media vacuum and to these these uh, silhouettes that were becoming on social media. And so my question about that is, how do you continue to engage as a writer when the the readers are becoming silhouettes, when the readers are becoming representations of themselves and their activity is rather than to consume and digest material like yours, but instead of doing that, they're trying to just create and recreate and recreate this image constantly. Is there still a room for fiction in this kind of environment? Well, I think that, you know, that the fiction is, is many times there to challenge uh, uh, different narratives. And I think that, you know, the, the more uh, uh, dysfunctional and the more alienated the social media uh, 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 narrative will become, I think that the more inspired I'll be to write because, because I, if everything would be perfect, you know, I would just live my perfect life. But there is an aspect of it of, I would say, a pro- protest in writing. You know, I always say to my student that writing is always the plan B. The plan A is to live, you know? Yeah. It's like, and the plan B is if you can't live the way that you want to, you can at least write about a, what you want to do or against what's happening now. And I, I always say to my students that, you know, that the most beautiful uh, love poems, you know, the Shakespearean sonnet, they're always about unfulfilled love. Because, you know, if you're able to fulfill your love, you're too busy to write poems. You're with the person you love, making love to them. You know, you don't have time to write those bloody poems. But, but if they just dump you, then you say, I can't have them, but at least I can have a poem about them. So I actually think that, you know, that, that you know, when, that when the going gets tough, then I think the artist should get going because it's really interesting because, you know, I mean, you, let, let's say, uh, if 
when I, when I went to my last vacation, there were uh, three girls coming there uh, in the late teens. And when we got to, to the resort, they told us that it's going to be sunny today, but it's going to rain for the rest of the week. So those three girls came with a set of all the swimming suits and all the clothes that they had. And they keep changing them and taking photos of themselves in this kind of two hours frame where it was still sunny. So they will have an Instagram photo for the next week, you know? Now, there was something about this situation of, of seeing those girls hysterically switching the clothes, you know, and then running to this perfect spot and then a, a kind of putting the lips in this kind of weird instagram <laughs> way, you know, the girls put their lips yeah. some, in photos, that, that, that it looked some kind of an existential metaphor. It wasn't something that they say, oh, I don't want to write anymore. I say, yeah, I must be also like that, you know, when I have speaking engagements, so I don't uh, bring my lips out, but I try to give some kind of quote, I don't know, Nietzsche or Chris Teva, so people will think I'm smart, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so whenever I actually see a fault, you know, it doesn't matter if it's in the zeitgeist or just an asshole I bumped into, it always kind of echoes something that I recognize, you know, both for myself and from humanity in general. So, I, you know, people wrote masterpieces in times of war and in times of great horror. And I must say that, you know, that we are not living in a time of war or great horror, but we are living in such a fucked up period that, you know, that any person who's interested in, in writing cannot say, I have nothing to write about. There's so mm -hmm. many crazy things to write about. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. And in addition to that, they have, new ways of actually writing, meaning of getting to an audience. And, you know, that's also something I wanted to ask you about, because you somehow defied all of the odds as a writer of short stories that, you know, the, if you talk to anyone in, in publishing that deals with fiction, they're going to tell you short stories don't work. And they've been preaching that for, for years and years and years. They always talk about the novel, blah, blah, blah. And you actually succeeded. You disproved the rule, um, which is quite incredible, but we're living now in a time where even um, disproving that rule within the world of publishing is, is is not really enough. It's kind of like the institution of publishing as a many other institutions has become in a way problematic. Like people look at it and they see this monolith that's connected to so many levers of power and to money and to all the things that they're trying to avoid. And they're going to find different ways, different avenues to reach readers. And it's something that you, I believe, are doing yourself with a Substack. I mean, you would think, why would someone in your position who has this really incredible literary success and profile um, need to go around the institution? Why would you even want to do it? But that's something that you've chosen to do. And in choosing to start your own Substack, you have even, I believe, inspired other writers, including one of the most famous writers out there. You can speak a little more about that. Um, to do the same. So what is the what is this impetus to for writers like yourself and, and writers like those who you've inspired to do this to do the same and go to find a substack for themselves? Why do that when you have access to the publishing industry, to the institutions, to everything you need? Why why find the alternate route? Well, well, I, I, I think the newsletter idea is totally connected to, to these two years of pandemic and uh, to me moving to Berlin, because uh, I think that uh, as a writer, uh, I must say that I'm a writer who loves uh, readings. I love live readings. I love uh, hearing stories, you know, from people who, who enjoy my work. Uh, I love interacting with the audience. And in the time of the pandemic, you know, we, I couldn't do that as often. And I kind of missed that. And it, gave me this feeling of uh, as if like, you know, if, as if my writing was a little bit like shouting into a well, mm. you know, yeah. because I publish a book every six or seven years. And in between, if, when you don't meet people and you just write your stuff, you say, does it really interest anybody or does it work or that doesn't it work? And, uh, and uh, for me, uh, knowing that when I go to Berlin, I'm going to lose even more of my kind of close proximity audience because I could, can't give my stories to my neighbors anymore or to my high school friends. Then I said, you know, I want to have this kind of uh, 
ecosystem uh, to which I write. And what I discovered through the newsletter, which I think, it, you know, in no way it's going to replace me publishing books or doing anything else, was that I could actually initiate the creative uh, collaboration. For example, I have this thing uh, that I call it a matchbox story. Every month, uh, I ask the, the subscriber of the newsletter to inspire me by sending me a, a photo, a sentence, a plot idea. And I promise to take one of those ideas and to try and write a story out of it and dedicate the story, of course, to the person who gave me that idea. So there is something about it that I don't usually write this way. You know, I don't usually, somebody says, hey, can you write a story about Squirrel? Hey, can you write a story <laughs> about somebody who got reincarnated as a mango? You know, can right. you do that? And, and, you, and the thing about, about writing is you can't write something that isn't your own. You know, you have to right. own it to write it. But what happens is that when people offer you all those kind of things, you say, wow, this thing, maybe I can own it. Maybe I can find a path to it. So uh, I've already written two stories that I really, really love that, I'm, that wouldn't have been written if not for my subscribers who sent me a beautiful photo or a wonderful sentence that had inspired it. So this kind of interaction is something that I love. Mm -hmm. There's another thing that I do in the newsletter that I really, really love is that uh, in, the, in, in the newsletter, you have those kind of uh, funding members. You know, it's like people who pay more money Yep. And they, they told me in Substack that you're supposed to give them something for it. You know, I don't know, send them a book or something. And I came up with this idea that the, every funding member, I will name a, char a character in one of my future stories after this hmm. person. Wow. That's cool. But so I won't come out this kind of a flatterer and ass licker. It will always be a pathetic <laughs> character who will die a horrible <laughs> death. <laughs> so, so I have this kind of tradition where I say, oh, yeah, and I have this guy, yeah, this guy is going to be a demented elderly man who gets run by a bus, yeah. <laughs> so, so there is something about it that, that let's say, if, there, if writing is always kind of, for me, some kind of an implosion that everything goes into your brain, then suddenly mm -hmm. in the newsletter it goes into my brain, but I don't feel as much alone because I can take some readers with me, I can listen to the comments, I can say, would you want another story like that? And you know, and there is something in this fluidity that is very interesting. And what, what I discovered about the Substack newsletter, it's called the Alphabet Soup, that unlike, uh, let's say, publishing stories in social media, when I publish stories in social media, the, the people who get to read stories are people who are bored. Mm. You know, they're bored, so they go to Facebook to right. say, ah, Oh my God, this guy ordered this fish dish. What a nice photo. Oh, and this guy is inside shell and this guy's riding an elephant and Edgar wrote a story. And it's all about on the same level. It's just yeah. about bored people dealing with their border. But when you do this kind of newsletter because people have to subscribe to it, then the commitment is really stronger. So you know that the people who are gonna read your story are people who are interested in the story because they wouldn't have subscribed in the first place. And this creates a bond that is much better, you know? I mean, being Israeli and being always very opinionated about things, I always been in, there were always uh, points uh, in my personal history where my Facebook page was filled with people not thinking politically like me saying, uh, we just burned your books in the yard, or we just flushed them, or we're never gonna read you again, oh. or whatever. And you know, and there is something about those moments that it's always uh, very confusing, mostly because usually the people who write it can't spell. And you say, how can I have my books in the first place if you can't even spell we burn your books correctly? But, but, uh, but I think that even more than that, that you like to feel that, you know, it's like, let's say if my stories are my children, then you wouldn't want people to bully your children because of something that you did, right. you know? Which is, by the way, something that is very, very much popular now with cancel culture. You know, it, it's not a, it's, it's really, really something that is beyond right wing or left wing thinking. It's just the zeitgeist. It's like you live in this kind of a place where you have a lot of lynch mobs right, right, uh, riding around looking to hang people who have it coming, who has it coming. And some of those lynch mobs have the ideologies closer to you. And some of those lynch mobs have ideologies that are further from you, but they're all basically lynch mobs. 
They were, all, they were all riding around with torches, looking for people to kill without a trial. So, so I'm saying is it kind of taking this step back and saying, you know, you know what? I'm in a newsletter, and I kind of build this hierarchy where it's not about my opinion, it's not about uh, me, it's not about what I ate and where I go to vacation as a, pa as a package deal. It's about my writing. You can like it, you can dislike it, you can criticize it, but don't tell me, you know, your story sucks and the, and the, the fish and chips plates that you put a photo of three days ago doesn't look tasty at all and your wife is ugly and your child is too short. You know, it's really, it's, it kind of, it, builds this kind of a compartment and create some kind of rules that they actually help me be in, in, the, in the mode that I want to be when I'm creative. Because when I'm creative, I take my defenses down, you know? So, so in social media, it was very, very difficult basically taking your defenses down when so you feel this kind of border and hostility around you. And, and, the, and that's why the newsletter was for me kind of a a, a huge change. It wasn't like kind of saying, oh, I tried this one, I tried something else. It was basically just kind of building my own club. And I can't help thinking that, you know, I don't know, those couple of thousand of people that are on my newsletter, it's like, I feel that they are my homies, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. they, don't, they don't identify with the, my ideas. Maybe they think I should write a novel. Maybe they think that they don't like the endings of my stories. But we, we kind of come from the same place. We, we both seek a, some kind of an authentic truth. We both seek good stories existing, you know? We, we are kind of those Amish guys uh, building our church, you know, in, in this kind of, a, a, in the a middle of a meadow and not just a bunch of people running around in train station asking each other for a light, you know? Yeah, it's... It's what Seth Godin, who's the great writer and marketing guru, and I think he's a bit of a philosopher, actually, a thinker. Um, he called it a tribe, a, a tribe in the positive sense, uh, people who belong to something together and not the tribe in the negative sense, which is the, the tribalism we, we see on social media, where it's everybody get the pitchfork out when someone says the wrong word. Um, and it's this, I think the difference being that as you pointed out, you're delivering it directly to the person. So there's the connection is one to one, not one to four billion as it is on Twitter, which is a very weird thing. It's a very unnatural way to connect. Um, you inspired a writer to, to, and I believe it's Salman Rushdie, yeah. if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Salman Rushdie, he gave an interview to The Guardian when he started also a Substack a, a, a newsletter. And he said that he, he had been reading my newsletter and it seemed as if I was having so much fun that he got jealous and he wanted to have some fun too. And first mm -hmm. of all, you know, it's a huge compliment and yeah. I really admire uh, Rushdie's writing. But, but I think that, that it didn't surprise me that let's say a writer like him would jump on this wagon. And there are other writers, that, I don't know, I can think about Gary Steingart or, or George Saunders. That yeah. I feel that they're more li like likely to, to jump on this newsletter wagon than, than, you know, a many wonderful writers, I don't know, like Paul Oster or other writers that are more kind of class, classicists because mm -hmm. I feel that with Rushdie, there's all, also this kind of thing that is always seeking a story. You know, it's, it's really, I think it's really the difference between, um, I would say uh, some writers uh, are like kind of a, a agriculture, uh, people, you know, they, they write a novel, so they go out to the field and they plant things and, you know, and they go every morning and every morning after five years, they have something. But I feel that there are writers, you know, even uh, novelists like Rushdie, that they are more like uh, hunters in the woods. Yeah. They're going around and say, oh, wow, yeah. you know, I can eat this thing off the tree. I can hunt this animal and eat it. And, and, and they say, all the time, seek the interaction with the story. They really don't want to create something out of not, nothing, but they want to, to have some kind of a dialogue with the world mm. uh, through writing. And, and I do believe that the, these kind of newsletters are gonna uh, uh, attract writers that are more into kind of experimenting and doing weird stuff that they didn't do before, then, then it would uh, drag in a classicist that basically want to write novels, which is, great thing but i'm not one of them 
Yeah, I know uh, Patty Smith is another good example from nonfiction who's also done a Substack or is doing a Substack. Um, and also, you know, many great journalists are turning to that format because either they've been sort of marginalized by the traditional institutions or they've been pitchforked by social media or both. And they, this is a middle road, which is like a very interesting way to think about it. You have these extremes, the institution, and then you've got the, the mob. And in the middle, there's this new path. And I think that's also part of the reason why it's so interesting for people like you and like Rushdie. And, and, and I think that, you know, when I looked at Substacks, because I must say that when I wanted to start this newsletter and I talked with, let's say, my peers, most of them were against it. Hmm. They, said, they said, it's not a good idea. Wow. And basically, their argument was that those new newsletters are very good for kind of niche writing. Let's say if I write about the baseball defense players, mm -hmm. then, then I have my newsletter and everybody who's interested in baseball defense player will go to it. Or if I do a kosher dessert, you know, a, for the holidays, then people will go to that. While the idea is that fiction is something that is so wide that it's not, it doesn't fit a newsletter. And I told my friend that, that the, my feeling is that the a fiction writing in the 21st century is it's a niche thing, you know, because when I was 20, you would ask somebody, what are you reading? Now today to ask somebody, if you, are you reading books? is a little bit to ask you, you, are you vegan? Do you do Pilates? Do you climb mountains? You know, it's really a niche. Yeah. And, I, and, and, and I'm not saying it kind of in a sad voice because I really feel that, you know, it's not the fact that people read less fiction means that stories have been pushed away from our world. You know, so people watch more Netflix series. You know, okay, I wish the Netflix series would all be amazing. Some of them are not, but theoretically some of them are good, you know, and so sure. it's, it's a different way to tell a story. But, but I think that, that the idea is that the, that the, let's say the, the fiction way of storytelling had become a more a, a kind of marginalized actually is a good excuse for us to have this kind of support groups, you know? Because like, I mean, if I like writing stories and if some people like reading stories, it's a little bit like uh, we are like the AA, you know? We are those kind of people that meet every week with our issues and problems and share them and one of, some of us tell stories and some of them listen to them and this is a great place to be in you know I really it's not as if I say I want to bring back the time where all the people in Israel would read the same novel and discuss it I don't think we're living in an age where this would be fitting it wouldn't work in a place that is not totalitarian if you have so many media options to force everybody to choose a certain kind of media and read a certain kind of text you know, we're exploding all over the place. But I think that in this time, it's really a good uh, move to say to yourself, I'm going to build myself my clubhouse and everybody who wants some tea, lemonade, cookies is going to come there and I'm going to tell them my story and it's going to tell me which ones they like and which ones they would want me to write. It just seems as if uh, fitting, you know, for these times. I also think it's very natural into just to the form into the format of, of fiction and of any kind of writing. You know, when we think about the Bloomsbury set of England, they weren't writing for a mass audience. They were writing for essentially for each other. And I think it was only, you know, post World War II in America where fiction became mass media and where respectable fiction, good fiction, literary fiction became mass media. It was a blip on the radar for maybe 30 years, maybe 40 at the most. And I don't, I think for some reason we came to think of it as the, that's normal and that's the usual, that ma that great fiction is mass market. But I don't really think that was ever the case aside from those 30 or 40 years. And maybe now we're coming back to something that is truly more natural to uh, to what fiction is, to what literary fiction is, which is something that is that speaks to a certain set of people who have shared beliefs and shared tastes, and that's good enough. That's more than good enough. It's great. I think that's essentially. Yeah, it's, it's, I think that you know that that past benchmark was some kind of a an historical mistake. It was a moment in time, but but it yeah. wasn't the way that things should should have been done. And I can tell you that when I began publishing uh, my first collection of short stories uh, called Pipelines, came out in 92. 
And whenever they would interview me, I would say in, interview, in the interviews proudly that I've sold 800 copies. And at some stage, the publicist of the publishing house called me and she, she asked me to stop saying that in interviews. Mm. And I said to her, why? And she said, because 800 people is not, is very, very little. And I said to her, I want to argue that the 800 people are a lot because yeah. I, I didn't come from the publishing world, so I couldn't compare it to anything. And I said to her, you know, in my elementary school, there were 500 children and I, wouldn't, and I didn't even know all the students. So imagine more of all the uh, numbers is greater than all the people in my school had read this. This is a lot. And yeah. she said, no, this is very little. So I said to her, you know what? When you write a book that 800 people would buy, then you can say it's a little. It's <laughs> Until then, I say it's a lot. Yeah. And I think it's really, really fun because, you know, I have many, uh, not many, but I have some writer friends who are really, really huge successes. Sometimes I could meet somebody like that and he would be depressed and I say to him, why? And he'd say, oh, I don't know. My last novel only sold 300,000 copies, you know? And I said to, to him, man, you know, when you, 20 years ago, when you were masturbating in the dorms and, and thinking of your first short stories, if I would tell you that not 300,000 people, but the 20 people who find interest in you and that one of them maybe would even tattoo an image from it on his arm. You know, you would say, yeah, I'm happy. I don't want anything more than that. Right. And, and I think, and I think that, that when it comes to this kind of reaching large audiences, it's the same kind of a capitalist, capitalistic yeah. curse that you, that you see with all the world billionaires, you know? Yes. It's funny, I, I once saw a, a documentary about Russian oligarchs. And, the, and the, one of the oligarchs said, when I meet millionaires, you know, I don't judge them. But when I meet a billionaire, I already know that he's fucked up. And, <laughs> the, and the interviewer said to him, why? And he, he said, well, because that guy, at some stage, he was a millionaire. And he had everything he could need ever for him and for his children. And he just kept going. So yeah. it means he's fucked up. And, the, and of course, the guy who was saying that was a billionaire himself. So he was kind of uh, reflexive. But, but, but I think... That, 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 that as a writer, I want an audience. I want people to read me. I want people to react to what I'm saying. I want people to, to feel that it matters, you know? But the idea that somebody would tell me that the 50,000 is okay and that the 2 million are a lot, but the 2,500 is nothing, it's just a bullshit thought, you know? I think about young uh, Homerus, you know? Uh, or, you know, when he would uh, uh, sit by campfire and tell people about the, the, the Odyssey, you know, mm -hmm. then how many people were there? Right. 20, right. 50, 80, you know, there were enough. Yeah, it's, it's that hedonic adaptation where, where too much is never enough. And this is the culture we're, we're educated by in TV and uh, social media, of course, where you, you've you got the money, you've got the success, and now you need the abs. And you get the money and the success, and then the abs, now you need the great charitable organization that you've created, and on and on and on and on and on. And there's just no end. And I think that's why we do need a reset, and probably why something like Substack represents a reset for a lot of people, because you can start again. You don't have to be judged by those metrics. You can be just creating one-to-one -one and let it be just enough. And again, to return to Seth Godin, it's such a great notion that he advocates for, which is don't look for the maximum that you can do, look for the minimum, the minimum that's viable and start with that. And that, that's the goal. And I think that is something we all need to remember especially people who are working in creativity and the arts. I mean, because we were caught up with Jonathan Franz and selling three gajillion copies of his book. And that's, that's the new metric. That's the benchmark. And it's insane. Yeah, it's like, it's like you know, I, when I look at my uh, son doing physical training at school, then, you know, as in physical training in school, in most of uh, the countries, it's the same. You know, the kids do a push-up and a... a bench presses and run around the yard and stuff like that. And I say, you know, this kid is going to come home and then sit five hours in front of his computer. Shouldn't mm -hmm. we teach him how, how to sit properly? Right. You know, how to work on his posture? Wouldn't yeah. it be more useful? But in the bottom line, you see a bunch of kids that one of them can do 
uh, 80 push-ups and the other guy can do 85. You know, and both of them are disproportionate with very short muscles, mm -hmm. you know, and back pains, but they keep going on this kind of same uh, graph, kind of trying onward and upward. And I think, and I think that especially in creativity, you know, it's, it's really more about kind of discovering new muscles and uh, finding flexibility in them and learning how to move mm. something that you were not able to move before than doing this kind of bodybuilder thing of kind mm -hmm. of, you know, just kind of having those humongous muscles that you only want to have muscles that are bigger than the person next to you. You know, I, I yeah. think really uh, there is something about, about creativity that it, it, it's more about discovering than about achieving. Yeah, I, I remember Stephen King talking about that with regard to the short story, is that everyone was always novel, 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 novel. And he's saying, take time to return to the sh short story for that reason. It's a different set of muscles. It's a different thing. It, it teaches you and you learn from it because it's really difficult to pull it off. Um, and especially the short stories that you write, which are really short. It's not, you know, that, and, and it's such a wonderful thing today where we're, we're just, you know, we're, we have this phenomenon of uh, TLDR, too, too long, didn't read. And it's, it's such a gift where someone gives you something that you can read just now and on, on the setting of the screen, just like the tablet essay by you that I mentioned earlier, what an incredible feeling to read this whole thing within a couple of minutes and really to understand it because you've given us what you've done the hard work for, for us by distilling it. To the, to the most fundamental. You didn't make me do the work for you, which is to trawl through it and try to understand what he's really getting at. He's really trying to say and spending 35 minutes just to read it and then another 35 minutes to understand it. And that's an amazing, amazing gift that you give to your readers. Well, thank you. You know, I, I feel that this has a lot to do with the fact that when I studied in university, then they basically my major was math and my minor was the philosophy. And, uh, and of course, there was a lot of things about those topics because I really liked lo uh, lo lo logics, lo logics in mm -hmm. math. Yep. And I really liked uh, also all kinds of uh, uh, logics in philosophy and the idea of looking for oxymorons or trying to understand how the systems and work was something that affected the topics that I wrote about. Are, but, the, but the aesthetics were very much influenced by the fact that in math and in exact sciences, uh, a compatibility is appreciated. Right. It's like it's like you know if somebody is a mathematician, you tell you my PhD was only six pages long. You know he's a genius. Right. But if somebody told, tells you that his PhD in philosophy was six pages long, then say and they accepted that without footnotes, it has to be at least five hundred pages long. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that 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 math can be very very complicated. But its wish is not to exclude anybody. You know, when you have the Pythagoras theorem, mm -hmm. there's something so beautiful about yeah. an idea that can be explained to a 10 years old, you know? Yeah. And this is the goal. While in humanistic, many times there is this idea that you want to dazzle your readers with the fact that you know much more than them and kind of put them in some kind of a stance in which whatever you're going to say will be built up. So I think that there was something in it that kind of uh, uh, reminded me in the humanistic attitude, the ways that uh, uh, the etiquette that people would have in the courts of kings, you know, you're supposed to bow in a certain way and to be dressed mm -hmm. in a certain way and to pass through the guards in a certain way. And I say in the bottom line, after you do that, it's very, very difficult to, to remember what you wanted to say in the first place. Mm. You know, I mean, when you get to the king, you know, just to say to him, oh my God, I think I ate something bad. I think I'm like the worst diarrhea ever. You know, you wouldn't even think of that because you was too busy of, you know, of wearing the crown the right way and yeah. nodding to the queen while not uh, ignoring somebody else. So basically all those kind of uh, codes became, become the main thing. And what you want to say becomes really, really minor. And when I came to math, in the end, when you read a proof, what you have is this kind of pure and distilled uh, uh, way of thinking. And that's what's interesting. The other stuff is really, really not interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, impressing, quoting, putting your stuff in context. It's just this idea of saying, hey, look, there's a bird there. It looks really strange. And mm -hmm. 
And I think that you know that the, the, the fact that I began writing while I was studying math really, really affected the mm -hmm. rest of my aesthetic choices. Yeah, I know, you know, I think that kind of decadence in, in the um, etiquette, like we see, I don't know if you've ever read um, Radetzky March by Joseph Roth, but there's this elaborate sequence of that, of just the, what you're saying, he's preparing to meet the emperor, um, one of the, the minor characters, and he's to go through this whole bowing and the uniform and having it cleaned and all this stuff. And what it signifies is a, a dying culture when you have to go through so much to get to the point, something is already rotten um, and you're dressing it up. Um, but, you know, I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you uh, so much for, for being so generous. Um, two final small questions. One is what are you reading right now? Uh, well, did you, did you see that in this kind of a German year? So my, my strange rules then that, uh, that I've made is that I only reread now things that I've read before. I don't read new mm. stuff. Uh, so yeah, because I, I really want to create this kind of huge vacancy, you know, to which mm -hmm. something new need, needs to be introduced. So I so actually the the the, the books that I'm kind of uh, revisiting that I revisiting right now are uh, some of the Kurt Vonnegut's novels because uh, 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 when I began writing, I began writing, I was inspired, I think, by two, by two books. It was the Kafka's Metamorphosis and Other Stories, mm -hmm. and Good one with Slaterhouse Five. And mm -hmm. I think both of them kind of uh, served as some kind of uh, uh, models of writers who are incompetent and dysfunctional, mm -hmm. which I can really identify with. That it's really opposite to the model of a uh, of let's say David Grossman or Amos Oz that are writers that you know that inspire me. I mean, like when you think about Kafka and Kurt Vonnegut, you know the one thing that they had in common is that they, you would never hire them as your child's babysitter, or you would never let them stay at your home when you're on a business trip with your wife for a week. You know, these are the guys you know you say you know, cannot be trusted, and I totally identified with that. So as a Right away, I said, ah, okay, so you can also be this writer who cannot be trusted. Mm -hmm. And I felt that it's a good thing that kind of 35 years later, I will visit those texts that kind of got me going. Amazing. And, and if anyone has never seen Vonnegut's um, great lecture, there's a video of it talking about story and the structure of story, how there's only like, he breaks down like the five, there's only five storylines ever. And the, it's a really incredible video. I really recommend people watch it. And one last question, which is the first time I've ever asked this, what's your, what's your favorite cafe to write in, to sit in, to be in? Um, what, what's something that really feels like your, your cafe, wherever it might be in the world? Well, I must say first of all that I love cafes because I'm a bum, you know, and I, and what I like about the cafe is that it's a good excuse to sit someplace and look at other people without other people thinking that you're weird, you know, because when you sit in a cafe, it really gives you the perfect legitimation to eavesdrop or yeah. to look at other people without them noticing you. But I never write in cafes because there is something about the, I discovered it the hard way because, you know, when when I began writing, I thought, you know, the best thing would be to write in cafes because, you know, it's fun, it's nice. People around you will know that you write, you know. <laughs> the beautiful waitress would say, oh, what right. are you writing? Right. And, you know, and that's kind of something that you want to you wanna get. But what I discovered is that when I write in the public areas, I have this kind of a tendency to conform. For example, mm. uh, many times when I write home, not, not in Berlin, but in Israel, I write naked or in my underwear, you know? And the truth, it's not nice to say, it, but I, I have this tendency when I write, I fart more. <laughs> I actually enjoy my fart. I kind of write something and then I get up and say, oh, oh my God, that was good, you know? So, or I can pick my nose. I can do all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. When I, I'm in a cafe, you know, you kind of aware the, of the conventions around you. You know, right. so you, you don't talk to yourself, you don't fart, you don't pick your nose. Mm -hmm. And I think that in my case, it affects the way that I write because I tend also to conform in my writing. Mm. So, so, so 
I, for me, the best place to write in is the place in which I'm not perceived by anybody. Mm -hmm. And then I can be as weird as I want. Uh, and when it comes to cafe, I have favorite cafes both in Tel Aviv and in Berlin. So which one would well, you? Let, well, let's go one for each. Great. So, so in Tel Aviv, there, uh, I, I, there is a, a cafe called the uh, uh, Lafit, and it's on the corner yeah. of Jabotinsky and Dizengoff. And, uh, and I, I, I go to it a lot. And I must say that the main reason is that the, uh, the guy at the store is like the Tel Aviv equivalent of soup Nazi. You know, he's really, really always very rude to people who come yeah. around and does all those kinds of peculiar things. So, so I think that, first of all, I like going there because I appreciate the fact that he actually serves me coffee and usually doesn't curse me, you know, right. which makes me feel good things about myself. But also, it's, a, it's I think that a, it's always kind of, there's always action around there. So when you go, mm -hmm. you, you want to see what's going to happen in this episode in Itzik's life. Who is who's <laughs> going to fight this today? And uh, in Berlin, uh, uh, there are a few cafes that I like, but there, there is one called the uh, Neue Liebe, which I really, really like uh, next, next to my home. It really, really looks, I don't know, like a caricature of a liberal left-winger <laughs> uh, hippies in the 70s or something, you know, mm. where everything is vegan and, you know, where it, it really kind of gives me this kind of feeling that when I see there, that maybe if the entire world would be a little bit like these cafes and everything would be great, we'll have mm. no more wars uh, in this world. Well, thank you so much. I will go. I, I remember Love Eat, and I, I remember they had a couple other locations. I'm not sure if there there was one in Nachlat Binyamin in Tel Aviv. I don't know if it's there anymore, but it was it was a really great cafe, very good coffee. But I'll check the the Jabotinsky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and if the guys will start being rude to you, say to him, Itzik, Edgar sent me. <laughs> I'll try that. So Edgar Carrot, for everybody out there listening, go check out Alphabet Soup on Substack. Um, is there anywhere else people should find you or should is the Substack the best place to start? Yeah, Substack, I would say it's the best place. Like, I mean, you know, I have all those Instagram and other things, yeah. but I think that my interesting stuff is on Substack. Amazing. Well, so Alphabet Soup, one more time. Um, I'm going to go subscribe myself right now. And um, and thank you, Edgar, for, for doing this and for, for your time and for being so open and talking about your farts and your nose picking and your fiction. And uh, hopefully we'll talk soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.